Support for this podcast is provided by Avalara. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes, and their solutions are designed to affordably scale with businesses as they grow. Collecting tax for the government is something businesses just have to do, but getting the job done efficiently and correctly can be an incredible challenge because tax rules and regulations are endlessly complicated. Avalara keeps track of how thousands upon thousands of products are taxed in more than 13,000 tax jurisdictions, and that's just in the United States. And with more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point of sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash tax notes. That's avalara.com slash tax notes. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, salt substitutes. As states have begun wrapping up their 2021 legislative sessions, a new trend in state tax policy has emerged, a rise in pass-through workarounds to the state and local tax deduction cap. The $10,000 limit on the SALT deduction has been a major source of contention since it was enacted as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. Higher tax states, like New York and California, have viewed it as a threat to their tax regimes and led others to explore legislative workarounds to the federal policy. So how are states approaching these workarounds? And are they the most effective way to deal with the SALT cap? Here to talk more about this is Tax Notes senior reporter Paul Jones. Paul, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Dave. Good to be back. Now, Republicans enacted the SALT deduction cap as part of the TCJA, and and some Democrats have been quite vocal about wanting to repeal it. Could you give listeners some background on the politics behind the policy? Sure. Republicans in Congress backed the policy to help pay for the new tax law. And part of the debate ever since, as you noted, has been whether capping the SALT deduction was a sort of swipe at high tax progressive states, uh, often blue Democratic states, where taxpayers may have relied upon the deduction to help offset the high state tax burden. And progressive Democratic politicians have accused Republicans in Congress and the Trump administration of sort of seeking to undermine their tax structures. So why are these states going toward these workarounds now? Well, in fact, both blue and red states have been approving these workarounds, even though there's been a lot of talk about these being targeted at Democratic states. There's about 19 states that have adopted them total, I believe, and about 12 of those have been in 2021. And the workaround essentially applies to taxpayers that receive pass-through income. The state creates a tax that the pass-through entity pays, in most cases via an election, on its income. And the state then gives the owners a tax break, usually a credit to offset that tax on their pass-through income. And the effect is that the entity is paying the state income tax for its owners, and it can take a full federal deduction for that state tax, unlike the owners who are limited by the cap. And the benefit of that full deduction is received by the owners. And this is seen by states as a way of helping those taxpayers offsetting the cost of their taxes at the expense of the federal government and ensuring that they are a more competitive or attractive business environment. Now, I understand you recently spoke with someone about this topic. Could you tell us about your guests and what you talked about? Yes, we spoke with Nikki Dobay, who's a partner with Evershed Sutherland, and she talked about the adoption of this work around by states, and she also delved a bit into the different rules that states have adopted for their particular version of this type of work around. And she also got into some other issues, including whether Congress might actually repeal the SALT cap before its scheduled expiration, which obviously would impact whether these policies are going to be particularly impactful, and a lot of other issues that I think listeners will find interesting. All right, let's go to that interview. Nikki, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Paul. So let's get into some of the issues. So after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed, we saw a couple of different kinds of proposals for how states could try and help taxpayers sort of work around the $10,000 assault deduction limit. And there was one that was popular for a little while. A number of states adopted it, and that had to do with providing taxpayers with credits for donations that they made to state-supported causes. But the IRS put the kibosh on that and said that it would not allow that to work. But then we saw uh, more states begin adopting these so-called pass-through entity-type workarounds. 
And the popularity of that particular model of workaround has surged since the IRS and Treasury said in a notice in November that they will allow that type of workaround wherein the entity, the pass-through entity, pays the tax and is able to take a full deduction because the SALT cap applies to the individual taxpayer and not the entity. So you've got a whole bunch of states that have said, well, this sounds great. Uh, let's follow the lead of some of the early adopters. We'll adopt this as well. And so they've all got this type of workaround. But as we've discussed before, it's not the case that this particular type of workaround as adopted by each state is identical. All these states have a little bit of a, of a variation between their model. Can you sort of talk to some of the differences that we're looking at here between states pass through entity workarounds? Sure, Paul. You know, it wouldn't be a state tax discussion without us talking about how the states all like to be different. I will attribute this to Bruce Ely. Um, when we were working on the RAR partnership project with the MTC, he described the state's approaches to the RAR provisions as each state was like a, a snowflake, uniquely different. And I think that really applies here as well. As you mentioned, you know, we I think we saw Connecticut was the first state that adopted this um, back in 2019, um, maybe 2018. And their model was a mandatory model. It's the only state that has required pass-through entities to use this workaround, if you will, that it's basically a mandatory tax, but they also provide a corresponding credit. Where the rest of the 18 states that we've seen adopt salt cap workarounds have gone is an elective model. So maybe it sounds like, okay, we've got one and then we've got 18 other ones but it wouldn't be that easy of a conversation if that were the case either. So I really divide these into, there's two big issues. There's the who can elect in to these salt cap workarounds, and then we'll talk about how they work. So let's start with the who. There's a variety of different ways in which the states are doing this with respect to who can elect in. And so some states have rules on what types of pass-through entities can elect in, you know, Oregon, for example, only pass through entities that have individual owners or a single pass through layer with individual owners can elect in. Other states will allow a pass through entity with any pass through owner to, you know, so it could be a corporation or another pass through entity with other corporate owners. So the states definitely vary there. So you have to look at kind of who can elect in to begin with. Then you have to look at some of the specific roles about how a pass-through entity might elect in. I think this still falls into the who category because there are certain states where you have to get all of the partners in alignment on this. And, you know, I think there's definitely a group of folks that become owners and pass-throughs or, you know, partners and partnerships because they don't like to be told what to do. So getting all those folks to march in one common direction, I think will definitely have its challenges. So, you know, we've seen the states put in some very strict restrictions as to kind of, you know, what specific types of entities and then what will need to happen for an entity to elect in. So I think that's one level of how different these really are. And then when we move to the how, it's how does this salt cap workaround work so that it effectuates what we're trying to get to, which is to lower the overall federal tax burden by applying the tax at the entity level, but then also making the partner whole at the state level. And so we see one variety and one path the states have gone down where the income attributable to that partner where the partnership has paid tax will be excluded from that partner's state income. So we, we see an exclusion methodology. And then we see several states, and I think this is probably the majority role, that provide a credit. And there they're going to get a state level credit for the state tax that was paid at the entity level. And here again, we don't see everybody perfectly falling in line. We see some states giving a dollar for dollar credit, and then we see other states providing a haircut. So really a variety of different ways in which the states are doing this. And this is all before I think we really get to how the information gets put on the form 
and what type of, you know, what are the mechanics of the election going to be? How is this going to be reported to the partners? And, you know, we don't have uniform rules with respect to state level K-1s. So going to be a lot of challenges there that I think practitioners will be working through for quite a while. Right. So it sounds like for entities taking advantage of this, there's going to be some complexity and there isn't going to be one approach that everyone like a a tax professional or a partnership can use. But as we've also discussed, there's also some implications that could complicate the use of these workarounds if you are an entity that is operating in multiple states. So if you're a pass-through entity that just operates within one state, then you've only got to worry about that one state's rules. But can you talk about what one of the problems might be for an entity that's operating in multiple states that has partners potentially in multiple states, or at least operations in other states, that is is paying one of these entity-level taxes or possibly multiple entity-level taxes as part of multiple workarounds in other states? What is one of the major problems there? Yeah. And, you know, as we've seen the proliferation of partnerships generally as kind of an entity that's doing business on a multi-state basis, you know, that wasn't always the case. Often it was corporations that that were operating on more of a multi-state basis. I don't think that's any longer the case. So we have a lot of partnerships that are doing business on a multi-state basis. Layer on top of that COVID and the remote work environment, you now have partners in these entities that, you know, may no longer be residing in the state. You know, you may have a a single state partnership, but the partners have now moved. So a lot of complexity has kind of been overlaid on this already complex issue. I think one of the challenges and, and probably the biggest minefields as partnerships try to figure out whether or not they will elect into these salt cap workaround regimes is thinking about where the partners in that partnership are residents. And has the resident state that the partners reside in, will they recognize the credit or the exclusion from income in that situation? And that's where I think we still, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a few states, DC comes to mind, Virginia comes to mind, where the states had clear guidance prior to these salt cap workarounds that disallowed an individual resident partner to take a credit for any taxes paid at the entity level. Why would we have cared about that pre-salt cap workaround? Well, we had states like Ohio imposing tax on partnerships. Texas, you know, there's a handful of states that do impose just an entity level tax. So we've got some guidance out there related to a totally different issue that seems to be prohibitive for purposes of what's going on here. We also saw New York include very specific language that, you know, a credit would only be provided if I think it's there's some substantially similar language. So, you know, what does that mean? And so I think we're just going to see a lot of states having to grapple with Will they be respecting, you know, a credit that a an individual resident taxpayer is trying to claim for tax paid at the entity level in another state? And I don't think we have, you know, a clear answer on that. And and it will definitely be an area to watch. So that's, you know, and that's kind of the simple version. That's if you've got a partnership operating in one state, they make the election and you've got a resident in, you know just one other state. What if you've got partners in, you know, 20 different states? So it's really, you know, you've got to make the determination as to what is the impact to, you know, the partners for purposes of making the election, but then also will they get to claim that credit and see the benefit in their resident state? And and so as you can imagine in the multi-state environment, there's just going to be a lot of questions there. Right. We're going to have to take a sort of wait and see approach as to how these issues are addressed. Support for this podcast is provided by SafeSend. Extension season is here. Eliminate stress with tax automation software. SafeSend Returns eliminates the manual, labor-intensive tasks that many tax departments experience. Take the work out of assembling and delivering completed tax returns prepared in 
CCH Access and Pro System FX, Thomson Reuters UltraTac CS and Go System Tax RS, and Intuit Lacert. Firms love the time savings, the ease of capturing e-signatures, and the tracking and reporting. Clients love the intuitive, easy-to-use interface. Schedule a demo to experience this time-saving solution for yourself at safesend.com. That's safesend.com. Before we delve any further into some of the more technical aspects of this, I also wanted to ask, as, as we know, the salt cap has been controversial, particularly uh, progressive Democrats have sort of uh, savaged it as uh, an attack on blue states, uh, which often have more progressive tax structures in an attempt to pay for more services, et cetera. And, you know, after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was approved, a lot of people were complaining that this was potentially going to undermine or threaten those states' tax models. And so we've seen a lot of talk recently, now that the Democratic Party controls Congress and the White House, that there may be an effort to repeal the SALT cap before it expires, I believe, at the end of 2025. Is there, in your opinion, a likelihood that that could happen? Are these salt cap workarounds sort of a, a day late and a dollar short in the sense that just as states are adopting them, they may be about to be kaput? Or is it likely that the cost of repealing the cap is going to be an obstacle that those who would want to see it repealed are going to be unable to overcome? I think the more interesting question in some ways is because the salt cap is meant to expire are these a day late and a dollar short for that reason? I think that was some of the thought at the beginning, but now there are all these discussions about the salt cap being repealed. I'm not holding my breath. You know, there's been a lot of discussions about tweaking the salt cap. You know, I think we've heard 15,000 thrown out there, you know, increasing it from 10 to 15,000, and then also doubling that for joint filers. So providing some relief in that way. But to the point you made, this was one of the biggest base broadeners when the TCJA was adopted. And so, you know, what do I mean by that? So under the TCJA, we saw significant rate decreases on the corporate side. We saw some rate decreases on the individual side as well. Well, in order to uh, make up for those, we had to, there were all these base broadeners that were adopted as well to kind of increase the base so we could lower rates. And this was a significant one. I want to say it was in the trillion dollar area. And so it's a really, really hard hole to plug. Now, what I think is going to be fascinating to watch, Paul, is do these salt cap workarounds kind of negate that base broadener and kind of make it at the end of the day, maybe the Fed should just bring it back because we're all going through this big process and, and they're not getting the base they wanted because the states have found a, a workaround, which the IRS is blessed. Or maybe we see the IRS retract from their guidance. So I think this is definitely an area to watch. And I, I think the states will continue down this path as long as it looks like the cap is going to kind of remain. Right. So in your opinion, no one should be waiting for the federal government necessarily to repeal this. It's more a question at this point as to whether these workarounds are successful enough to sort of counteract the salt cap in, in a broad sense generally. Yeah, I feel like this is one of those slippery slope moments. Like, you know, we've already started down this path. It's going to be very hard for the federal government to retreat 100% and go back to kind of the way life used to be. My sense is we're going to get to some middle ground eventually. And what specifically that looks like, I don't think we know yet. Based on one of the things you mentioned, obviously, which is that the federal government may have to take a look at this and see if these workarounds are really becoming sort of an existential threat to the policy. I should note, as you've previously mentioned uh, in our conversations, that the Treasury and the IRS both put out this guidance in November saying this workaround will be recognized, will work, will be honored. But it is August of 2021, and we still do not have any guidance. We've had all these states passing their version of this type of a workaround to the salt cap, but we don't really know yet what the actual final sort of rules for it are going to look like. What do you think that tax professionals and taxpayers are going to need to see from the federal government? What are they looking for? And what risks are there, if any, to the policy, the use of these workarounds that exists 
until we have some kind of really solid guidance from the federal government about how it's going to work and what they are and potentially are not going to allow within the, the context of this. Interestingly, Paul, everybody's gotten pretty darn comfortable with this just based on that IRS notice that came out last year, because as you know, what did we see? I think it was about 10 states, uh, maybe more that all passed these salt cap workarounds this year. And when you read that guidance, it doesn't get in the weeds too much. It really just blesses this concept of, yes, the entity paying the tax falls outside of the cap is adopted by the TCJA. And the, the IRS does say they will provide additional guidance, but to your point, we haven't seen it. So I don't know at this point how high on the IRS's kind of list of to-dos this is. You know, it doesn't seem like they're overly concerned with this issue. I don't know if maybe they thought the states wouldn't move forward all that quickly, or this wouldn't be that big of an issue, but it would be nice to see some guidance. It would be nice to see, you know, what specifically will a partnership have to do on the forms to, you know, to make sure this is all copacetic, but I just don't think we know that. And right now everybody's kind of just operating under the assumption that it's all, you know, we're all good. And I think the, you know, the IRS can't provide guidance on how these credits will work or these, you know, exclusions at the state level will work. So, so there I see some risks that partnerships and practitioners and partners are going to have to deal with, get comfortable with, because we just don't know what's exactly going to happen on that state side. And I think at the end of the day, those credits could be a big deal too. So I don't have anything great on what the IRS will do. Hopefully we get something and it, you know, it will provide the detail so that everybody is comfortable that for, for federal purposes, we can kind of carry on under this methodology. But, you know, until we see some cases or there's challenges where states have denied credits or, you know, these, you don't get the exclusion in a state, in a different state than where you paid the tax you know, the, the IRS can't bless that. And that's going to all be questions that get dealt with on an individual state basis by state tax courts. And we'll see what happens there. Right. So even if, you know, when, and if we get a little bit more detail from the federal government, a lot of this, you know, the way it's been written about, it sort of seems like it's sewn up. The IRS has given approval. This is how it works. But until we actually see this implemented, even with federal guidance, we don't really know how it's going to work. Is that a fair statement? I think that's really fair. Again, I think everybody's gotten pretty darn comfortable that they're going to be able to get the deduction at the federal level. I think where things get a whole heck of a lot more murky is going back to your initial example, you know, if you've got a, a solely intrastate partnership, all the partners are in that state. And the, the state rules seem pretty clear that you get the, the credit or the exclusion. You know, you I think you check all the boxes and you can go home and and this salt cap workaround really did its job. Once you've got a partnership crossing state lines or partners crossing state lines, that's where you're going to the questions just start to kind of coming at you. And I think they're going to keep coming at you until we really know the specific rules at the state level. And all I can say is, you know, you've been here a while, but welcome to state tax. To that point, if, if we assume that the salt cap isn't repealed, that the IRS, the Treasury or Congress doesn't decide to say, hey, these workarounds are negating this policy, we're going to try and disallow them. Even potentially when it comes time for the salt cap to sunset, maybe the concern about the revenue hit is such that it gets extended, assuming the salt cap workarounds are not so undermining the policy that it's no longer serving its original intended purpose. If this is something that maybe is a longer term issue, or even just for the period of years these things apply, if there's enough you know, potential you know, interest at stake. Is there any potential for states to maybe modify these, to try and amend them, to make them a little bit more consistent with one another? Yeah, uniformity would be great if, you know, the salt cap workaround is here to stay. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So 
you know, I, I think we're going to see evolution in this space. I think we're going to see more states adopt these indefinitely the next few years. You know, it's a little bit reminiscent of marketplace and remote seller collection laws. The states went full bore. We didn't quite get that uniformity we were hoping for. So I think we're in a little bit of a that situation here. The MTC just kicked off a couple of weeks ago a massive project looking at many different issues related to partnership taxation in the state tax space. And this is an issue that they've got on their list of things they will be talking about as part of that work group, uh, that project. That project is so massive, I worry a little that this particular issue might get lost in the weeds. And I think it's one that is particularly relevant right now. And so maybe that's incumbent upon the business community to really use their voices and say, hey, you know, we really need the MTC, we need the states, we need everybody to come together and think about this issue. It would be wonderful if we could see a model. It would be wonderful if we would we could at least get comfortable that the states that don't have salt cap workarounds will nonetheless recognize the credit or the exclusion provided by a state that does have a salt cap workaround. So I think just getting some clarity on some of those issues um, would be really helpful to the extent the MTC could help facilitate that. I think it would be great, but I think there'll be continue to be some evolution. I think on the practitioner side, we're all still kind of wrapping our heads around these different pieces of legislation, trying to figure out which one we like the best. And, you know, once I think the practitioners kind of can figure that out, then we can come forward and say, hey, we look at this state. I think they did it really, really well. And so I think that's still a little bit of a work in progress because probably shouldn't have caught us by surprise. But in some level, I think, you know, the amount of bills that passed this year, we were it, it kind of got everybody's attention. So it's like, OK, now we've really got to dig in and, and figure all this out because it's probably not going away. Yes, it's definitely been a huge surge since that uh, November guidance came out. And, you know, we've been discussing this for obvious reasons in the context of the salt cap workarounds as they're intended to function and the thing that they're intended to accomplish. But I think now that I'd be remiss if I didn't also bring up another point, which is that even leaving the salt cap aside, is there some potential for these workarounds now that they have established for a very specific reason? and under very specific sort of unusual rules, a tax on pass-through entity as opposed to the members. Is there potential that this could be turned by at least some states into a different policy long-term that you could take that entity level tax and start using it for something other than just circumventing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, limitation on the SALT deduction? I think that's a definite fear that has been on the minds of some of us in the policy space. I think that's also why there wasn't probably a land swell or whatever that phrase is of, you know, kind of the business community behind this, because I think there, there was just that fear that, okay, this is a new tax on pass-through entities. And we've really got to trust the state that they're going to give that credit or that exclusion. By way of example, that was a very significant concern here in Oregon when they were passing their salt cap workaround because credits have to come up for a mandatory review every six years. And the fear really was, well, what happens if the credit doesn't get renewed? Well, you know, I got pretty comfortable with the proposal because the pass through entity level tax in Oregon is elective. And right now, as I mentioned earlier, all but Connecticut, these are elective. So right now it's really the partnership that will have to evaluate whether or not they want to elect into this regime. And and so, you know, I'm going to be a a glass half full person right now and say, so long as, you know, if if the credit goes away, then no one, they're not going to take away the election. And so this is just kind of one of those odd code provisions that will have somebody scratching their head in 50 years, trying to figure out what the heck was all this about. But if the credits go away or the exclusions go away and we see the state start taking away the election, then we are in a much different situation. Yeah. And I guess everyone is just going to have to sort of keep watching this to see how it develops based on uh, all of the unknowns. But 
you know, we started off the year with only a handful of states with these workarounds, and now we're closing on half. I guess I do have one last question. Do you think that these are sort of the bulk of the states that are going to want to implement this policy, or do you think that potentially even more are going to be adopting this, possibly even retroactively for the next year? Yeah, great question. I suspect there's going to be some more states that jump on board. I don't know that any state's going to go retroactively unless, you know, one particular state model jumps out as like, everybody just loves it. And then, and it, you know, it's like, why wouldn't you do it? But I think we're going to continue to see the states move in this direction, especially if, you know, there's absolutely zero movement on the salt cap workaround, or if we really see, you know, the feds kind of double down and make the salt cap permanent. So I definitely think that this isn't the end of the story when it comes to states adopting these. You know, it was interesting to see a few state, I think it was the governor of Michigan that vetoed their bill. I don't really recall the politics as to why that was done, but, you know, we kind of danced around this a little bit, but, you know, there's some interesting bedfellows on this policy as well. But I think we'll see more of these in the future. And I think we'll see tweaks to them. And, and I really just do hope they're tweaks in the direction to make these easier for partnerships to comply with and to take advantage of if the goal is, you know, to achieve those policy goals that everybody, I think, thinks we're trying to achieve. Nikki, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing your insights on this issue. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, Paul. Happy to be here. Now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, David Burton and Alex Leff consider how proxy revenue swaps are taxed in the hands of renewable energy project owners. Thomas Spade argues that the IRS isn't honoring Congress's intent in Section 7508 Cap AD causing continuing uncertainty regarding filing due dates for taxpayers in disaster areas. In Tax Notes State, Carl Frieden and Barbara Angus review the unprecedented convergence of international, federal, and state tax policies represented by the OECD Pillar 1 and 2 proposals. In the next installment of The Search for Tax Justice, Wilton Hyman reviews two books that address the wealth gap between Black and white Americans. In featured analysis, Joseph Thorndike explains how America's form of economic subordination is not something of the past or limited to quasi-colonial territorial control. On the opinions page, Robert Goulder and Ruth Mason discuss the reasoning behind the OECD G20's two-pillar agreement compromise and debate whether a final agreement will be unanimously approved. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, I'm here with Philip Wolf, an associate at the law firm Belcher, Smolin, and Van Lu, and we're going to discuss his new column in Tax Notes International called The Tax Scribe. Welcome to the podcast, Philip. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So to begin, could you give us a brief overview of your column and where the idea came from? Yeah. So my column is called The Tax Scribe. It talks about kind of tax writing and kind of how to be a good tax legal writer. The idea came from The fact that, you know, in law school, a lot of the time we learn kind of the nuts and bolts of tax. But when I started going into the job world, I've seen there's so much more to learn that, you know, I haven't learned in law school that I've had to pick up. And one of those things really is to know how to be a good writer. I'm still learning. It's a process that, you know, it probably take me a lot. It's going to take me many years. And I know there are a lot of people that have a lot more experience in this than I do. But uh, I thought it would be kind of a helpful thing to write about each month for young practitioners such as me, and also for anybody else who has interest in it. I think writing about writing is awesome. Obviously, it's very much so what we do here at Tax Notes. Now, in your first column, you lay out five steps on how to write effective opening paragraphs in taxation. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about that process? During the last few years, what I've kind of begun to realize is that a lot of paragraphs can be broken down into five simple steps. To go through them, the first one is to, before you even write the paragraph, figure out who your reader is. If you know who your audience is, 
uh, you can write something that'll be more convincing to them, right? If your reader is a tax professor, you might have a different way of writing than if it's a judge or if it's an IRS agent or if it's somebody else. So there's, there's different styles, depending on who your audience is. Knowing that style will basically know how to convince them of your main point. The next one is kind of your first sentence. Your first sentence is kind of like your sales pitch. Somebody reading your first sentence must know exactly what you're going to be covering. The next step is basically what's called the because. So a lot of times when doing analysis, I found that the easiest way to analyze something is to write because, you know, is to say this is true because of this and then give kind of reasons why. And actually, funny enough, as simple as the step sounds, it took me quite a while before I realized that this was actually the easiest way for me personally to do analysis. Obviously, for other practitioners, it's probably different. And for people with more experience, I'm, I'm sure you could um, add a lot more. I'd love to hear about it. The next thing is step four, which is called the action item, right? At the end, you want to say what you would like to be done, right? If you're trying to convince a judge to, you know, to rule in your favor, you have to say, basically, this is what I'd like you to rule on. Or if it's, you know, it's a conclusion about some sort of analysis, you say, you know, you basically want to say the, the reason that you rang the paragraph at the very end. And then finally, of course, is revision. No writing and no tax writing is complete without a great deal of revision. So um, those are my five steps that I figured out. And I understand there probably are a lot more. More advanced practitioners will probably know a lot more than me. And uh, of course, if you have any suggestions, I'd really love to hear them. Wonderful. And before we let you go, where can listeners find you online? I have a LinkedIn. I also have a Twitter handle, which is wolf, like the animal, 10, Philip, or you can email me at my corporate email, which would be pwolf at bsvlaw.com. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us on the podcast today, Philip. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor. And I just also wanted to say a special thank you to Kathleen Phillips for you know, always encouraging me to do these types of columns and for really going out of her way for me. So uh, thank you so much, Kathleen. You can find Phillips' article online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Analysts, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy in tax notes. Again, that's Tax Analysts with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at tax stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish, and guest relations coordinator, Krista Goad.